today we're going to be talking about last week's China-U.S. summit between President Joe Biden and President Xi Jinping of China. It was an interesting moment in bilateral relations, especially given the recent escalations over the past year from the Biden administration when it comes to China-U.S. relations. I also want to talk about President Xi Jinping's speech that he gave in San Francisco. And to join me, I'm uh, welcome. I, I would like to welcome KJ, uh, outstanding member of the China is Not Our Enemy campaign, and just a very, very insightful scholar who has, and journalist who has been reporting and studying these issues for quite some time. It's such a pleasure to have you, KJ. Thank you. Pleasure to be with you, Cole. Thanks. I um, I want to start by asking uh, China and the United States for, I want to say, the better part of a decade have been on a collision course to conflict. Many say that we are in a Cold War, if not approaching one. Um, and some say that we're on the brink of hot conflict, of a shooting war. Uh, with multiple areas, you know, whether it's the Taiwan Strait, the South China Sea, also the Korean Peninsula is an issue which affects China US relations, rather, the ongoing Korean War. Uh, moreover, there's the trade war launched by the Trump administration and continued by the Biden administration. Most recently, uh, President Joe Biden tapped his uh, Indo Pacific. Uh, czar for the uh, uh, to to be deputy secretary of state. Um, he's awaiting confirmation to actually take that office. But I want to get your insight on what does Campbell's potential appointment mean for China U.S. relations, especially with those escalations uh, in the background. Campbell's appointment is very, very bad news for U.S.-China relations. Um, Campbell is the individual who is responsible for architecting the Pacific pivot, which is the plan of encirclement and escalation and rollback containment against China. This was developed uh, around starting around 2009 by Kurt Campbell, uh, declared by Obama in Canberra 2011, uh, about five days ago to this, uh, uh, about, uh, uh, it was declared 12 years ago and five days uh, ago uh, to this date. And that essentially signaled the kickoff point of U.S. escalations against China came with a plan of encirclement, of military encirclement, of escalation. It also had an explicit doctrine of war called air-sea battle, and it also had an economic arm, an arm of economic warfare called the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Uh, so it was an incredibly belligerent uh, maneuver. And in order to understand this, we kind of have to like dial back a little bit earlier to the 1990s. Remember, in the 1990s, after the fall of the Soviet Union, the United States essentially declared in its defense planning guidance document that it would be the unipolar hegemon. That's a fancy way of saying it would be the boss of the world. And you had this neocon tri triumphalist crowing where they declared the end of history. History had ended. Uh, they were uh, history's victors. There was nothing else that was going to change uh, U.S. exceptionalism and capitalist neoliberal, uh, you know, uh, system was was the was was the final word on on political uh, history. And the only thing that was left were a little bit of cleanup or mop up operations, and they can they uh, engaged in these mop-up operations uh, in the Middle East. Uh, and this continued uh, under the rubric of the war against terror, uh, uh, primarily against what they referred to as non-state actors. 
uh, and essentially they considered themselves to be doing what they referred to as armed social work. They were in control and all they needed to do was to continue to do a little bit of social work, armed social work, and put the natives in their place. All of this uh, upended around 2007, 2008, when the global capitalist economy collapsed. And it was only through the aid of China that the West and the United States was able to pull itself out of uh, this complete systems collapse. And uh, as a result of that, uh, instead of uh, expressing uh, gratitude towards China, no good deed goes, uh, uh, you know, uh, unpunished. And this was when the plans, which had been uh, incipient or uh, on the distant horizon in the 1990s, were put into concrete form. And so we started to see this plan for encirclement uh, architected by Kurt Campbell, air sea battle, which was a doctrine of war essentially to choke China out uh, and to strangle it in the South China Sea with you know, deep penetrating aggressive strikes inside the Chinese mainland, essentially to decapitate and to destroy it and to create complete chaos. Uh, and then we also saw the Trans-Pacific Partnership. The Trans-Pacific Partnership was discarded, but we still have uh, a kind of continued form uh, in the uh, various uh, sanctions that uh, we see currently that the US engage is engaging in for decoupling. So all of this is to say Kurt Campbell is, is very, very bad news. Uh, he is what, uh, what, uh, uh, Cannon was to the first Cold War. Uh, Kurt Campbell is to this second Cold War. And I'm very, very concerned that this Cold War is rapidly heating up into a hot war. Now, there was, I guess, you know, some might call it um, a, a step towards some kind of change. I'm referring to the summit last week between President Joe Biden and President Xi Jinping. Um, you know, there were some agreements, mainly things around like people to people exchange, like more direct flights and, you know, easier visa access, um, as well as, you know, a few other significant things like the, the fentanyl bill and some uh, climate change uh, commitments, not necessarily really big, um, ticket reforms, though, to uh, China-U.S. climate cooperation as it stands, which is virtually, um, you know, zero since former Nancy Pelosi visited Taiwan uh, last year in 2022. But, um, you know, right as that, uh, right as Xi Jinping and Joe Biden were meeting, Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin was traveling across the Asia Pacific, um, signing new, uh, sorry, announcing new military agreements with multiple countries, India, South Korea. Um, what is the message that I guess the United States is sending by, on one hand, having a very frank and seemingly constructive summit uh, in San Francisco, but on the other hand, still continuing the same policies of encirclement? Well, the message the U.S. sends is uh, Jekyll and Hyde, good cop, bad cop behavior. And this is deliberate. As I said, they refer to it as armed social work. It's the, the roses, the flowers, and the beatings, followed by roses and flowers and beatings. It's the kind of a pendulation back and forth between manifesting overtures of good behavior followed by punishments, chastisements, threats, intimidation. And all of this happens at the same time. And this is part of a coordinated doctrine that the US has worked out uh, during the Afghan war. Uh, the uh, think tank called CNAS came up with a doctrine called Cohen or counterinsurgency. This is the armed social work. Uh, and essentially the idea is to uh, treat the official enemy in this constantly uh, vacillating, pendulating way in order to disorient. 
And so what we can see here uh, in the San Francisco summit is just a kind of a, a momentary um, kind of lull or pendulation or a tactical uh, retrenchment because the U.S. has its hands full in the Middle East and in uh, in the Ukraine. But I, I would say that it doesn't change anything. Uh, currently, you know, we have a poly crisis happening, which is uh, disempowering for, you know, the hegemon of the world. And uh, what it is doing, um, I think a good, uh, I think a good analysis is um, uh, an Australian uh, professor uh, by the name of Warwick Powell said that essentially it's an act of deceit in preparation for more war, just as the United States uh, and the EU was preparing or pretending to negotiate over Ukraine over the Minsk Accords, uh, and therefore, you know, disarming and giving the impression that it was interested in diplomacy, even as it was arming to the teeth. Uh, Powell argues that essentially the same dynamic is happening against China. That is, uh, Taiwan Island is being Ukrainized to the max. Uh, it's being packed full of weapons. Japan and Korea also packing themselves full of weapons. Uh, the Philippines is also militarizing. And as all of this militarization is going on, you know, there is this overture of, uh, of diplomatic engagement, which is kind of smoke and mirrors, a kind of subterfuge, if you will, uh, to buy time, to, uh, to regroup in this you know, poly crisis. Uh, and to move the, um, you know, move the crisis, uh, move the threat uh, even further. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a little bit like that game of Red Rover. You know, you freeze when you're looked at, and then as soon as you think you have an opportunity, you keep rushing forward. And each time as they escalate and get closer and closer to a kinetic war, that becomes the new floor. This is what they mean by guardrails. They say, oh, you know, we're doing these uh, things and now these are the new guardrails. And each time they've ratcheted up the hostilities and the tension even further. So of course, in the San Francisco summit, there were, you know, some token uh, outcomes that we can point to, you know, agreements around uh, fentanyl precursors, you know, mill mill, deconfliction channels, uh, discussion around AI. But the real core issues that needed to be addressed, that is Cold War, hot war, economic war, and provocation around the Taiwan, all of these were passed over in silence. And so that signals, uh, that sends uh, you know, a very, very poor signal that any uh, de-escalation or calm uh, in this current moment has to be taken with a pinch of salt. Uh, it should really be considered uh, the, you know, the, the calm before the storm. Now, according to um, the Chinese delegation, uh, President Xi did raise uh, U.S. interference in Taiwan during their discussion, uh, but, uh, you know, the the White House readout was, uh, of course, quite different. Uh, you did have um, a lot of right wing people in Congress. Uh, I'm thinking of uh, Representative Gallagher, who uh, falsely claimed that you know China uh, that she threatened um, you know the people of Taiwan, uh, the residents there. Um, during the discussion, of course, you know, there was no such threat made <laughs> during um, any of the discussions on record. But, you know, it is the case, though, that, you know, U.S. interference in Taiwan, as you mentioned, has not uh, stopped. Uh, in fact, this just in the past few months, there's been a number of escalations, such as arming Taiwan with the foreign military financing program, which is only reserved for sovereign nations, which is uh, in many ways a violation of the one China policy, which the U.S. officially says it believes in. There was, you know, also the first time we're arming Taiwan with U.S. tax dollars in 40 years, 
as opposed to just loans. Uh, and we've seen, uh, I guess this is not in the past few months, but since 2020, you know, U.S. forces have been in Taiwan. Um, of course, you know, there is this uh, strange kind of cycle where Biden will say U.S. military, the U.S. military will go and fight uh, with China over tensions in Taiwan Strait, and then there'll be walkbacks from someone else in the administration. Knowing that, you know, reunification uh, between Taiwan and China's mainland is like a very, you know, um, important issue to Beijing, why is the U.S. poking there um, if it, it does claim to believe in the one China policy? So the U.S. is using Taiwan as a provocation, just as it used Ukraine as a provocation. Um, all uh, invasions, seaborne invasions of China have either happened through Taiwan or through the Korean uh, Peninsula. And so this is the source spot. This is geostrategically critical. Taiwan is the center of this encirclement. And the United States knows that if it creates enough irritation on Taiwan, primarily through arming it and also by uh, encouraging uh, secession, because Taiwan is an integral part of China, then China will be forced to respond. The analogy that I sometimes give is that, uh, you know, it's like you have somebody in your family who's locked themselves in their room and they're not coming out. That's fine. You make sure they have water. You make sure they have food. But from inside their room, if they start packing their room full of weapons and explosives and gasoline, then the question becomes, how long can you tolerate that before you have to disarm that situation? And that's the situation that the United States is trying to create for China uh, right now over Taiwan Island. Uh, if, you, if we think of an analogy, it would be imagine that China was arming separatists in Texas or California or any part of the United States which has secessionist tendencies, and these exist. Uh, and if China was not only arming these secessionists, but uh, deciding or declaring that there were actually two Americas, right? That there, there is uh, the United States and then there is another legitimate uh, state and all the while pretending that it's not doing that, but packing, uh, you know, this secessionist tendency full of arms, giving them training, giving them millions of dollars of weapons, uh, and then uh, flying or uh, moving your ships close to uh, that state. How long would the United States tolerate this? Would the United States tolerate this? I mean, it would be seen quite literally as an act of war. But essentially, this is what the U.S. is doing. And it has passed legislation called the Taiwan Enhanced Resiliency Act, uh, which was simply a, a reshuffling of the Taiwan Policy Act, snuck it in through the NDAA. And so now this is legislation uh, that has passed. And essentially, it is uh, a plan on the part of the United States to, quote unquote, ensure the independence and sovereignty of Taiwan province, an integral part of China. It is the US has declared that it is going to ensure the independence and sovereignty of uh, Taiwan Island. And it has uh, within this legislation, it has plans to micromanage the political affairs as well as the military uh, of Taiwan Island. I, I really want to, uh, you know, uh, also explore the dynamic between like the Biden administration, um, what its goals are, like uh, with, you know, the the wider Asia Pacific region, because, uh, you know, we you mentioned the TPP, uh, the Trans Pacific Partnership, um, which you know was initially this uh, way to have like a more uh, what the United States calls like the rules-based order uh, applying to trade. 
uh, in the region when, you know, of course, that that um, term rules based water is very problematic for a number of reasons when you kind of look at the way the United States kind of doesn't really think the rules of the international community apply um, to it to, to itself. But, you know, we've seen Lloyd Austin also uh, ramp up the U.S. militarization of the Philippines, expanding bases there. Um, just yesterday, they um, launched joint sea and air patrols in the South China Sea. You know, the U.S. is also uh, with Australia and Great Britain patrolling the region with the AUKUS military pack. Japan's getting in the action as well. U.S. Marines are um, militarizing uh, Okinawa um, and a lot of the other islands in Japan aimed at China. Uh, you know, a lot of people don't really understand that, you know, for someone living in Beijing, this seems like the recreation of uh, the Eight Nation Alliance almost, which is, you know, a group of imperial powers that subjugated China in the 19th century. Um, so, like, with all these military alliances, uh, do they really think that they're going to uh, build up popular support across the region for a war against China, uh, especially yeah. with those people? Yeah. They're not looking for popular support. I don't believe that any of the citizens of any of the countries uh, in the Pacific or around China want war. It's the Quisling elite uh, that is driving their country to war, just as the Quisling elite in, um, in the Ukraine uh, you know, provoked uh, uh, this war. So in South Korea, you have Yoon Suk-yeol, who is the most unpopular president in the history of uh, Korean, uh, you know, poll poll taking, uh, he's driving the country towards war. He's uh, re he is creating an alliance with Japan, which is the former colonizer of Korea. This is something which was unthinkable until Yoon Suk Yeol came into power, uh, and Kishida is enacting the Japanese desire to remilitarize. Uh, these are unrepentant militarists who, at one point uh, prior to the, you know, the disarmament, they killed 25 million, 30 million uh, Chinese uh, uh, in, uh, you know, in on the continent, and they want to remilitarize uh, and become, you know, the kind of attack dog for the United States, along with South Korea. South Korea has 3.7 million. Uh, troops, highly trained, highly effective, that can be put at United States di dis disposal at an instant because the U.S. has operational control over all of South Korea's troops uh, under the current, uh, you know, agreements. And so that creates a huge moral hazard in terms of manpower, cannon fodder. It has endless cannon fodder, essentially, to throw up against China. Uh, the Philippines has also been dragged into this. Again, you know, this is the son of the dictator Marcos, who himself was a U.S. Quisling, and now he's cast his lot with the United States and is militarizing. He's created, uh, given the U.S. four new bases, and he's going along with U.S. provocations in the South China Sea, which are the main choke point against China. There are three uh, key areas or key flashpoints along the Pacific. Northeast Asia along the Korean Peninsula. That's like the bridge of the nose if you want to think of a vulnerability. There's Taiwan, which is like the chin. It's the core interest. It goes straight to you know the center. Uh, and so Taiwan is, is the second vulnerability. And the third is the uh, South China Sea, which is really like the throat or the carotid artery. Uh, essentially, it's the place where China can be choked off. And the Philippines is allying with the United States, with Australia holding up the southern front in order to create the possibility of choking China off along its key trade routes in the South China Sea. So all of this is very, very 
uh, you know, worked out in detail. As I said, Air Sea Battle was drafted in 2009, and they've drafted multiple uh, revisions and new documents regarding war with China. And so all of this has been escalating no end. But it speaks, uh, you know, foundationally to the fact that, um, you know, from China's standpoint, they see it as not simply like the eight nation alliance, I would say that it looks like the Hideyoshi invasions of 15, uh, of, 15 uh, of the 1590s, uh, when Japan tried to in invade China and Korea. Uh, and then uh, I think, you know, regarding the Trans-Pacific Partnership, uh, there's a dimension of this war. There's a Cold War escalating into a hot war, which involves military escalation and sowing uh, bases and armaments like dragon's teeth all around China. It's like a perfect noose. And then there's the other dimension of this, which is lawfare and economic warfare. And the TPP was uh, a very, very concerted uh, attempt to choke China out of the economic system uh, in, uh, uh, in the Pacific and essentially isolated. Uh, that didn't work. So now you have a whole bunch of other sanctions. Uh, Biden tried to transform the TPP into the IPEF, the Indo-Pacific Indo Economic Framework, which is simply a, a, you know, kind of a, a TPP uh, version two. Uh, but that has run into some roadblocks right now. But all of this is to say there's a constant economic warfare. There's a constant attempt to isolate and exclude China from the economic system, sanction it as if it were Cuba or Iran or North Korea. And at the same time, this constant lawfare, legal warfare that is happening. And all of this is framed and facilitated and made possible by this constant barrage of information warfare. That's really the pre-kinetic and the subkinetic dimension of this escalation against China. Constant demonization, constant propaganda against China, constant lies and mendacity in order to justify violence and war and to manufacture consent. Yes, I, yeah, I thinking about that too, it makes me realize how the, the war, the push for war with China also is uh, not only threatening China and countries in the region, it also has a negative impact on um, people living in the United States because this propaganda will, you know, uh, lead us potentially to a conflict that will be very, very bad for the lives of so many people here. I, I just think about also how the TPP, uh, you know, even though the United States didn't end up uh, getting into it, it would have been a massive corporate um, uh, theft of, you know, public wealth and, you know, this, this really affects us um, as well, uh, especially vulnerable people. Uh, it's a, a very harrowing, you know, moment for China-U.S. relations. It's a very harrowing moment globally uh, with what's going on from the genocide happening against the people of Palestine to the other forever wars the U.S. is involved in, uh, in Africa and the Middle East and Eastern Europe. Um, as well as you know the ongoing blockade of Cuba, but I want to circle back to where we can maybe find hope. And I was reading Xi Jinping's speech that he gave after meeting uh, Biden. He said, "Peaceful coexistence is a basic norm for international relations, and is even more of a baseline that China and the United States should hold on to as two major countries." It's the wrong view. It is wrong to view China which is committed to peaceful development as a threat and thus play a zero sum game against it. China never bets against the United States and never interferes in its internal affairs. China has no intention to challenge the United States or to unseat it. That's Xi Jinping's words. I wanna you know, get your response to, do you believe that China, China's president uh, says that in good faith? And if so, how should the United States respond if it wants to be serious about peace? Well, 
You know, this is the dilemma or this is the challenge, uh, Kale. I don't believe the United States is sincere about peace. What it wants is uh, a tactical pause. Uh, and I think that, you know, we just have to name it. You know, the empire was built on genocide uh, and it has perpetrated multiple genocides and it is willing to perpetrate genocide again it is even as we speak right before our eyes a genocide is happening in palestine uh, there's no other way to describe it uh, and the united states is green lighting and enabling and running cover for it uh, and i think you know just uh, think back to the images that we have of jabalia refugee camp pulverized into dust children pulled out of the rubble, uh, entire families dead, uh, you know, grieving mothers, uh, uh, what's that term, wounded child, no surviving adult. Mm -hmm. You know, this is how the empire works. And I'm thinking back to, you know, South Korea uh, or the Korean War, when uh, the, the first time that the U.S. went to war, with uh, China, uh, and they pulverized North Korea into dust. Uh, uh, journalists traveling through North Korea at the time said that it was like traveling on the surface of the moon, that there was nothing left standing. If you can imagine uh, Jabalia refugee camp, you know, multiplied by 10,000 fold, that's what you had. Everything, every, every house, every school, every hospital, every childcare center, every outhouse was pulverized into dust. Uh, this is how the empire functions. And so, you know, when you ask, you know, what is, um, you know, what gives me hope or, you know, where is, you know, where is there a cause for uh, optimism? Um, I'll be honest, I don't think there is a lot, uh, but, uh, I think even inside that, you know, we have to be optimists of the will, right? Pessimists of the mind and optimists of the will. I do think that the Chinese made a very, very good faith effort to engage with the United States uh, in a stabilizing and uh, uh, positive fashion. Uh, originally, they had asked the United States to ensure the five agreements of the Bali summit. If you recall, the Bali summit of last year, the US agreed that it was not going to try and change China's system, it was not going to try and engage in Cold War, it was not engaging in hot war, it was not doing economic war, and it was not going to encourage and provoke China over Taiwan. It was respecting the uh, one uh, China principle. Uh, and then immediately after the Bali summit, the United States initiated the BIS sanctions, the CHIP sanctions, which uh, the New York Times characterizes as an attempt to extirpate root and branch China's uh, technological uh, ecosystem, essentially to prevent China from developing any further. It, they referred to it as an act of war. CSIS referred to it as a four-point strangulation with intent to kill. Uh, and, um, and uh, this time after the, the summit here, uh, immediately after the summit, another set of enhanced BIS sanctions kicked in and they're tightening the tourniquet even tighter around chips, uh, not to mention all the other sanctions that are all in place, not to mention all the other military exercises that are happening as we speak, uh, the turning of Taiwan into a military base for the United States, B-52 runs uh, in, uh, in uh, Korea, a strategic nuclear bombing rehearsal uh, over Korea and right next to China, et cetera. There's an escalation is constant. So even inside this incredibly escalated situation, the Chinese are making a good faith effort with the United States and saying, look, uh, let's get this right because the world is big enough for both of us. There's no need for us to be on this path of conflict. Nobody wins. 
and therefore we have to engage and find a way to uh, find mutual understanding and win-win. And so they gave a five-point plan. They, you can see they put a lot of work into it, but the first point is we have to have right perception of each other. We are not out. China is not out to get you. They're not out to replace you. They're not out to dominate you. Jointly develop clear understanding, and that can be the foundation upon which you can build uh, a right communication, manage disagreements skillfully, and prevent you know uh, conflict. Uh, develop mutual cooperation, jointly shoulder responsibly, develop public goods for the benefit of the whole world, and then jointly develop people-to-people -people exchanges to support all of the above. They put forth uh, a very, very constructive program. They offered to work together towards it, and it fell on deaf ears, as far as I can tell. And so what we have remaining is President Xi's uh, outreach to the people of the United States, which is really about developing people-to-people -people exchanges. I think this is the one bright spot uh, in that I think that the Chinese leadership understands that if the US leadership is not willing to uh, step up and uh, engage in a constructive fashion, then the appeal has to go out on a sub-national and, uh, and on a people-to-people -people way. And I think President Xi, simply by virtue of his uh, sincerity uh, and presence uh, when he gave those speeches, uh, I think that he uh, made some inroads in that. He received three standing ovations, and I think that uh, in and of itself uh, speaks uh, volumes. Yes, well, I I really concur with uh, you know how you find hope in people to people exchanges on the horizon, especially since you know we have peace activists um, who we're always working with uh, at China as our enemy who uh, go to China and come back and share what they've learned, um, and you know uh, on the point about like. Uh, the future where China and the U.S. could produce public goods together. Uh, you know, I think about the COVID-19 vaccine um, when in the height of the pandemic, you know, it took the U.S. a long while to actually agree to, you know, um, uh, not, um, you know, let let the vaccine be, be, be patented and, um, you know, there was, or you know, allow other producers, and, you know, China was able to uh, come out and say, you know, the vaccine should be a public good, and this really kind of goes, I think, to the heart of how, you know, it's important to just reframe uh, this, the, the way our priorities are, you know, uh, we should be doing these things, solving global problems together, um, and, you know, I guess this is one of the reasons why, you know, it's important to keep building the peace movement and uh, create opportunities for a peace economy and learn from, you know, insightful people such as yourself. And I just want to ask you, is there anything, any other observation of China-U.S. affairs that you think is really important for people to know? Well, you know, um, they say that, um, you know, history is made when uh, leaders meet and one or both of them is transformed. And in this meeting, uh, there was no transformation that happened. Uh, this is simply a prologue to more escalation. I believe that it's just a kind of plateau before there is further escalation. And I hope that I'm wrong but I really don't think uh, that uh, this uh, train, which is moving on a very, very set track, uh, as constructed by Kurt Campbell and his team at CNAS, uh, I don't think this train is, is going to deviate. Uh, at best, the only thing it's going to do, it's going to stop and refuel, but it's not going to move off its tracks. And so then it becomes incumbent upon us, even as individuals, uh, to work to build good, 
person-to-person -person relations. And I believe that if there's enough of, enough of us who do this, who tell the truth, who bear witness you know, to uh, the possibility of good relations, if we continue to do that, uh, then we have a chance. Uh, and so instead of you know, this large scale uh, tectonic shifts, what we need to do instead is to engage uh, you know, uh, on the retail level, if you will, uh, if everybody can build uh, relations uh, on a you know kind of massive people-to-people -people relationship, uh, then I think we have uh, a little bit of a chance. the The challenge there is that you know I think the the ruling elite are so set in their ways, uh, and they will not be easily uh, dissuaded. Uh, and I believe that they would rather see uh, the end of the world uh, than the end of their privileges. And so that's the danger and the risk that we face in this current moment. Indeed. And, you know, peace loving people can't let that happen. KJ, it's been so great to talk to you and uh, hear uh, everything you have to share. Um, thanks so much. And uh, I, I just want to extend to everyone uh, keep supporting peace and keep learning, seek truth from facts. Thank you. Thank you, Kale.